I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. It's about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Join movement expert Aaron Alexander as he dives into the minds of the foremost innovative healthcare thinkers and movement masters on their approach to optimal health and wellness. Online Podcast. Welcome back to Line Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander. Today's tremendous episode was with three of the most interesting, eccentric human beings that uh, I'm familiar with. Uh, world-renowned neurosurgeon, Dr. Jack Cruz, uh, style, like, like fashion design style slash lifestyle uh, expert, Luke Story, who's been on here before, and Matt Maruka, who's one of the smartest people that I've come across in the realm of breaking down conversations, complex conversations around the bioelectric effect of sun, of grounding, of all these kind of invisible aspects of our lives that uh, few people can explain in a really like tangible way, and he does a good job with that. So this conversation, we get into that, the effect of uh, movement that it has on our, our biology, the effect that it has on our personalities, um, the effect of light and grounding and all these really interesting esoteric conversations that are so dang important to the health of everybody. So a really fun conversation. This was p- after a Neil Strauss event that all four of us were speaking at. And afterwards, we rallied up to hotel room in Maria Del Rey and threw on some infrared light and had this pretty ridiculous and uh, really informative, helpful conversation. Hope you guys dig it. Um, If you enjoy this, jump over to the Lifestylist podcast to hear the second half, or the first half rather. So this is broken down. We talked for like almost two hours and we put the first half over on Luke Story's Lifestylist podcast. So hope you guys dig that. The first part was was really informative and um, I know you guys are going to love it. Thank you for jumping on the, li- the alignpodcast.com website, alignpodcast.com. Pull in there. You can start the five day movement challenge, which breaks down five fundamental movements everybody needs to have in their daily existence. And uh, that's all. Jump on it, alignpodcast.com. Thanks for telling your friends. Thanks for using iTunes. That's how this show spreads. It is really is dependent upon y'all, in a sense. Just telling your friends is like the most powerful compliment you can make for this thing if you actually appreciate it so thanks for that and final thing thank you to the people that have grabbed the align method online program which focuses specifically on unwinding those unsightly patterns of forward head posture rolled forward shoulders kind of that hyper kyphotic hunched over spine thing essentially staring into technology which is kind of what this conversation is about Um, it also gets into some movement flow stuff self-care stuff for travel um, it's really good. People have been digging it. So thank you all for checking that out. That's at alignpodcast.com slash align method, or just jump onto the line podcast Instagram page. It's in the bio. All right, here we go. Back to the shizzy with three of the most interesting dudes you will come across. Enjoy. Pow. Align podcast. Have you thought or heard of the idea that we're kind of human race is kind of like a caterpillar? And we're kind of sucking up resources right now. And eventually we're going to kind of go into the chrysalis or maybe like L.A. is the chrysalis. And then we turn into like the mushy goo and die and then transform into like a technological butterfly. Oh, God. <laughs> that's, that's, Somebody had to ask no. it. That, that's, that's a lot of transhumanist stuff. I don't like that but, stuff, but man. I'm going I'm, I'm gonna to be honest with I'm you. I'm a fucking human and I'm staying one. I'm well, just asking. I, I think that evolution is ongoing right now within our species. But... I will tell you, um, I don't think it's that as bad as you paint the picture. Do I believe, however, that there's cognitive de-evolution ongoing right now? Absolutely. Mm. I, I, think yeah. the, I think the current events that I showed today in my talk, that's pretty hardcore. I mean, even if you're a total skeptic. The celebrity suicides? And well, all not only celebrity suicides, but the number one thing that I really wanted to reach people with is when I put the slide up that showed that the number one cause of death in 15 to 25-year-olds no longer is traffic accidents and accidents. It's suicide. Mm-hmm. And I got news yeah. here. In my medical career, never in a million years would I thought that that would change, and that's now changed. Wow. And this is, this is one of the realities. You know, we got... We got a couple of young millennials here, even actually younger than millennials. Yeah, what's the generation? Millennials, you guys actually, are millennials are actually pretty old. You guys are Generation Z? 
That's yeah. gangster. Yeah. Yeah. Because oh. I named Matt's episode on my show the Biohacking Millennial. And yeah. then afterward, people are like, uh, he's not a millennial. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, it's good marketing. I'm sticking what with it. <laughs> it's, it's like older than you think. It's like 39 or it's like 40 or something really? like that. Is it I really? Believe. So, oh. yeah. It's pretty, it's it's like so a big gap for some reason. Yeah. Tech, um, well, I don't, I, I'm a baby boomer. I'm the, he, I'm the last year of the baby boomer. Mm. Oh, really? I think so. Maddie is not a millennial because he's not sensitive to criticism. <laughs> Millennials, uh, good you, point. you criticize them, they yeah. jump off a fucking bridge. Yeah, you don't like my shoes? <laughs> Maddie's pretty, pretty grounded. <laughs> bunch of snowflakes. I'm serious. Snowflake. I'm serious. I can't believe how sensitive people are. I think that's how we're de-evolving is through political correctness and everyone becoming I, so fucking sensitive that they're losing their emotional resilience. But that's why I tell you that makes me a little bit different on social media because you guys know that I can be pretty damn aggressive. <laughs> it's true. And and I want that. You Even know, toward people you like, like me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, 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 really, I really want to put people in chaos to see how they react because guess what? If they react badly, those are people that I don't want in my network. Like you said earlier tonight, hey, man, I got, I got a good network. I'm solid. Well, the, the thing is, how do you call your network? How do you get a good network? There's probably a lot of people out there right now that are going, yeah, how, how do I know who's in my circle of five? And when someone's in my circle of five, how do I make a decision to keep that person in or keep that person out? Because, you know, sometimes that person may be really important – in your family or your social network, how do you let them in and how do you let them out? That's why I always tell people my circle of five is constantly in evolution. Nothing is ever solid for too long. Circle of five meaning your inner circle of yeah, the those of are, people those you are talk the people. I always tell people if you meet the the top five people in someone else's life, you can learn way more about that person than you can ever learn yeah, sitting down absolutely. and talking to them. That's I think this good. gets I think that gets people into trouble sometimes as well, especially living in Los Angeles, because we'll become so attached to having the best of the best in our circle. Like Los Angeles people are notorious for always like looking over their shoulder that you almost have like nobody in your circle because you're always seeking someone better. Better? Yeah. It's sounds like fucked the Kim, up. Los Angeles is a lonely place. Well it sounds like the, the Kim Kardashian effect. I mean to me that is actually a low dopamine behavior. Right. So it doesn't surprise mm. me at all that you say that. Uh, I, I've noticed in different parts of the country, it's completely different. And yep. that's why I said I think there's a huge disconnect in our country. The point that I'm trying to make to all of you that I'd like you to take back to your old podcast and your audiences, I think the disconnect in the United States in zip codes is tied to how 5G is being deployed. Mm. That's what I'm telling you. Can you paint? The picture of exactly what that is? I can, but I'm not going to do it on a public podcast because I could probably get some people in trouble because I happen to know where things are and they completely marry up to where, if you look at where voting totals come in, they match up pretty clearly. I personally think the last election cycle, both the midterms and the presidential election before, they were contrived. And there was things that were done that were nefarious, but not by the people that you, Luke, me, or Matt would normally think. I think this was done by design. And what they're trying to do is they're stress testing the system to see just how much control they have. What can you see? You literally, how do you call it? Crack? Cut people's skulls open and yep. look at their brains? Yes. Cut can you oh. crack. Yeah. Let's get <laughs> first so of all when you, but, coconut, and, coconut, crack and, the coconut, yeah. crack the coconut. So he he's a brain surgeon. Do you know what music he listens to when he does surgery? <laughs> he yeah, listens to Pantera, tool, dude. He listens Have to Pantera. I'm like, no motherfucker is cutting my head open listening to Pantera and Slayer. Like that can't be good. <laughs> have you heard the the effect? <laughs> it's the true. E have you heard the the effect that that um, doctors can have on unconscious patients? Absolutely. That's pretty interesting. Well, this is why he I, always puts his hand on their heads. Before I, he I know. Them. I remember you told me that. I, did, I, I did. just heard yeah. that on your podcast. Yeah, I right. To, that's <laughs> yeah, so I, like, I remember that. Actually, before I operate <laughs> on anybody, the, the part that I usually uh, am going to cut on, I actually will sample it. And I started doing this before I was into all the quantum biology. It was just something that I did. I never knew why I did it. And I think it's. What do you mean, sample it? 
Me- meaning you're, that exactly what I'm doing. If I touch you on yeah. your bare skin, yeah. I'm feeling your biophotons. I'm uh, actually okay. sampling, you know, what's going on. And what that allows me to do as the surgeon, I'm connecting with your energy source. Oh, cool. And mm-hmm. when I physically do the operation, I believe in some way, and I don't understand how it actually works, but it makes a difference. And I always do it. And I did it before, you know, even I was connected to all this quantum biology stuff, and I never understood why I did it, but I was always compelled to do it. And I I would always talk to the patients right before they went to sleep, you know, and I I would tell them, I'm going to tell you what we're going to listen to. You know, and I had playlists <laughs> played out, and people would be like, and they were, they were actually into it, and they were interested uh. why I wanted to listen to what I wanted to listen to. It turned out for different operations that I do, I have different playlists that I listen really? to. Really? Yes. What, do you have anything that's uh, less um, aggressive? And- <laughs> yeah. Like if I do a carpal you know, tunnel, <laughs> I do. I'll listen to Sting. Shape of my heart. How do you like that? <laughs> really? I swear to God. You say if you do a carpal tunnel? Yeah. You're a brain surgeon? Yeah. Well, carpal tunnel? Yeah, we do carpal tunnels. We do all peripheral nerves. Oh, any, I had no uh, idea. We operate Neuro. on brain, spine, and peripheral nervous system. Oh, interesting. Any nerve is a peripheral nerve. I want to go back in time. Okay, you're <laughs> you're in med school, or you, or you just get your credentials, and you're doing your first operation. I mean, is there any point where you take some, you know, saw or crack somebody's skull open and look at their brain and like want to throw up or freak out or get sweaty or cry or I never, freak out. I never had that issue. Um, I mean, I just can't, I don't want to see inside I, someone's head. It totally freaks yeah, me out. You say that, but I'm going to tell you most people, like 95% of people really get into it. Like if you saw Jeez. brain surgery, you'd be like, it's so fascinating when you see it the first time. Um, there's very few people that really, even in medical school really pass out. They do pass out with other surgeries, but brain surgery is a little bit different. And even among seasoned surgeons, when we open a coconut, other people come in. Like, it's the last brain tumor that I, I did. Really? Yeah. I, it was a pretty horny brain tumor. Um, it was a, along the sagittal sinus. So this is one that you could kill somebody pretty quick. So we had a lot of people in the room, and there was a lot of anatomy laid out. So people wanted to see like where the corpus callosum was, where this was, where's that? Because these are things you normally don't see in the surgery. And a lot of people came in, and these are seasoned people, and they're like, this is cool as shit. Mm. You know, I wow. used to, I, I'll wow. say to them all the time, I, you know, it's like beavis and butthead. Brain surgery is cool. <laughs> Have you, you know, <laughs> but it doesn't affect me because when you're in the moment, like when you're the guy doing the cutting, you are so focused. When I tell you, if you, you know how like – you know, people used to talk a couple of years ago about flow states. If you ever wanted to see Jack Cruz in a fucking flow state, it's when I'm doing surgery. I bet. Dude, I am completely, it's almost an out-of-body experience for me. I, 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 I've never experienced that experience any time in my real life. But when I'm there... It's almost like time stops for me. And it's kind of like I know exactly what I'm doing. I know exactly how it's going to go. And everything, it's, it's almost like artist strokes, doing what you have to do to get out as fast as you can to make sure that the patient's okay. And I've never actually talked to anybody about kind of what's going through my mind when I do it. But um, it's, it's, it's really almost a fugue state. Hmm. It truly is. Wow, that's fascinating. That's why you don't want to quit, right? I, you know, I, 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 I don't think that's the reason why I don't want to quit. I think the reason I don't want to quit is because maybe I have the false belief that I don't think a lot of other people are out there doing what I'm doing for people in neurosurgery, using quantum biology and trying to help them get better. And I've had some pretty big wins. Like I can take really bad problems and help people out that – you know, I told you the story. I had a lady come in not that long ago that said uh, another surgeon operated on her five times, and she was on huge amount of medicines. And she said, "Look, if if you can't help me, I think I'm going to kill myself." Wow. And you know, you know, you guys hear stories like this, you know, on the media, but I don't think any of you ever had somebody come in and actually physically really tell you that. And when that happens, that's when you start to realize what my job is all about. That's when it gets as fucking real as a heart attack. 
okay? And that's when you realize you have an ability or a disability to harm or help that patient. And you, you have to be brutally honest with that person. Can you harm or help them and tell them the truth? So when you guys see me on social media and we talk about, say, magnesium chloride or for me, you see how easy it is for me to answer you yay or nay. The reason why, that comes from those decisions in neurosurgery. And for me, it's an easy decision process. If I think it's going to help you, I'm going to tell you. If I don't, I'm going to tell you that as well. If I'm pretty definitive on it, I can tell you that I've thought about it and I have some data to back it up. Um, but there's nothing, there's nothing, this is the best thing about medicine. There's nothing like connecting with a patient on that level. And when you know, and you tell a person that they're hurting and that you can operate on and you know that you're going to help them, you just get this little smirk on your face. Like I got this. And then they're scared as fuck. They go to sleep and they wake up and they're better. Dude. That's why you signed up to do this. That's cool. And, and you know what? You can't get that in anything else that I know. But that's one of the things that makes surgery a dopamine addiction for a lot of guys. Because guess what? You can actually really help someone. The problem is you can also fuck it up pretty bad. Yeah. You know, yeah. especially if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know what the limits of your ability are or the limits of what your patient's willing to do to help you get better. Because oftentimes with surgery, the patient has to have skin in the game. They have to be willing to do some of the things that need to be done. And not everybody's willing to do that. I'm curious. I can't. This is a quick one. Can you or have you operate on someone's brain while they're completely awake and not under anesthesia? Many times. Yeah. And so they're chilling, looking at you, oh, yeah. looking up Man. at you, and the top of their yeah. head is fucking open, and you're digging around in there? Mm-hmm. So you just do is local it, anesthesia around the cut? Yeah. You, well, what you is it true is, that you don't have nerves in your brain? Like, yeah, if you, well, you, if you, you had my skull open and you tapped on it, I wouldn't get the sensation right. of my the skin being touched on no, my brain. Is you would not. Whatever. No. Oh, wow. That's so interesting. Mm-hmm. Do you have a sense of um, where memories exist? Yeah, in water. Mm. Just did a Patreon blog on it. I suggest you join my Patreon. (laughs) (laughs) But it's a great blog. I will tell you, it's one of the best blogs that I've written in a long time. Mm. The water memory blog is is phenomenal. Can we talk about it here at all? Yeah. The water in your brain? Yeah, the water everywhere in your body. Do you is, know this that like, water? is this like a moto kind of kind of no, stuff, like water it's, crystals? It's way deeper than a moto. Moto is kind of what I call surface, surface kind of stuff. Water touches every square surface area of every protein in your body. The number one protein in your body is collagen. So water does have a memory. The memory is tied to topology. What is topology? It's the study of size and shape changes. Hmm. So it turns out when light hits water it changes the size and shape of the hydrogen bonding networks that surround each protein that information is transmitted to the protein and back it's a bi-directional device so memory is coded for in water so most people think that memory is coded for in the central nervous system like in the brain or in parts of the brain but you happen to be talking to a neurosurgeon who's taken large parts of people's brains out and it doesn't affect their memory at all. Yeah. Wow. Have you heard the the idea that's almost like memories and past experiences are almost like it's like a fractal in various like your whole existence exists in Nature, every part of the nature's brain. Nature's a fractal, Aaron. Yeah. I mean, we talked earlier today about Jackson Pollock. You know, I gave Luke and one of the other members for Neil the idea of exactly you know because you always hear people talk about dopamine, but they really don't break it down for you so you understand it people who are depressed who are going to kill themselves or who are fat or do drugs, those are low dopamine people. Those are the ones we always talk about. But you know who we never talk about? The people with high dopamine who have the high spikes, who are those people? Those are the people with schizophrenia. Hmm. Still a mental right. disease. So the point that I'm trying to make to you, it's not that all mental disease is low dopamine. Most of them are, but some of them are high dopamine. Then there's the part in the middle, which is the Jackson Pollock guys who painted in fractals. Why? Because when dopamine is not optimized, you see the world, instead of being smooth like it is right now, you see it in, in still shots. Yep. 
that's what the fractal nature is. And that's actually tied to the light that we use to do this. It's, it's a dopamine effect tied to UVA light. Who was the artist that their eyes were off, but it's what allowed them to paint the way that they did because they perceived the world? Van Gogh. Yeah, but there's was many, it Van Gogh? Yeah, well, there's many. And then when he found out. After he got his cataract yeah, out, right? There's Didn't many, he not want to get him removed, though, because right. he thought it would affect his well, artistic There's many artists eye. that have this issue. It's not just one. There's many. So I am oh, interested in kind of moving into something a little different. Um, we were talking that. about the body electric earlier on and this kind of thing, and I'm interested to ask you, Jack, is it possible, I have this little theory that all of the benefits or some of the benefits that Aaron ex experiences because he's all into movement, right? It's very cool, and I'm wondering how does this tie into the into your thesis? How does all the movement have such a positive impact? Because obviously you're out in the sun, you're in the ocean, you're doing all that stuff, grounding on the beach in the ocean. But is it possible that specifically all the piezoelectricity from what – what Becker uh, oh, yeah. researched is what movement, movement does move, in our body to look. stimulate the DC current, or how does that work? Movement, <laughs> movement is fundamentally a biophysical phenomenon, um, and we don't think about it like that. The neocortex, it's completely wired for us to act, but the thing is you need to have sensory input to do that. It's a bidirectional device. The more you move, the more BDNF that you get in your brain what is brain BDNF? derived nerve growth, growth factor. factor it's actually fertilizer for the brain yeah now too much bdnf is not good either because you have to trim it you know you have to make sure that there's not too much present but movement is another tool that one can use to stimulate and develop your central and peripheral nervous system what's interesting with with movement which i bet you have something to chill with this but i'm not sure but um you see different people's personality manifest through the way that they move. And so, you know, you'll see like um, like a CrossFitter person has a, a very specific personality versus like a ballet person or a West African dancer or a martial patterns, artist. Aaron, I'm very curious. <laughs> oh, man. What did um, you say? I'm, I'm, I, I like the way you slipped that in there. I don't. Because this is going to be a pretty I controversial. Know, I don't know if I have a, I have a, re a response that I'm. Why? Um, hmm. That that would be a better question. I think that the tell us tell us what your your first impression is. Okay, um, if I were to look at just from the movement perspective, I think it's good. Okay. Yeah, I try to say now stay in like the what, positive what end of, of things. What is there for you? Mm, I don't know that I would feel completely comfortable speaking about it here. From a movement perspective, what I've seen so far, I think it's 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 good stuff, and I've seen from the the guy himself. I've seen like an interesting evolution of his personality. Yeah. And I, I wonder what that is. Good. Because you know what? Y you've already said enough for me because your perception and my perception are equivalent. Mm. I personally don't believe you can be good at movement when you have a toxic personality. Yeah. I wonder what it is. Like I have nothing but love for him and any, mm. any, any person you know, really, whatever it sounds like. Some new I don't shit, have love for people that, that are toxic. I, I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> I call a spade a spade on that. But well, I, think I see, I, I see, I, I still see think hurt. you can do good things yeah. in the movement world as he appears to be doing, but there's something clearly disconnected there. Yeah. I just see, um, anytime I see anything like that aside, just any being that is, seems to be, Whatever, fill in the blank thing, like some distasteful attribute that I don't, I like, like irks me, triggers me. Mm -hmm. I just immediately see pain and I see the person dealing with that the best that they can. Um, you know, so yeah, that's, that's what do you think about that, Jack? About. I'm very curious because I've, through various studies, have come to believe a similar thing that when people are assholes, usually it just means they're actually really in pain of some sort and they're yeah, having trouble dealing with it. They've been injured. It. Yeah, hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about that? I don't I, I think I think that can be accurate most of the time. I don't know. I think there's some people that are pretty crafty that actually know how to use that to get responses out of people. Like yeah. I, I can tell I can tell you right now, I use I perturb people on purpose to make them uncomfortable because I want to see how they think. That's different though, I well, think. Well, no, maybe it's not different actually. Yeah, it could be different. I think it can be different and I think it depends how you use it. Mm. Um, I think if it's a, if it's a dominant theme, 
throughout your personality mean all the time. It's not just a social media phenomenon because I think the other thing that people need to understand, your social media persona from your persona in real life, when it's disconnected, that's when I think you can start to see how people use this to their advantage. I, I personally want to know how people think immediately right off the bat. Why? Because that's going to tell me a lot about them, whether I want to invest time in them, whether I want to sit down and talk to them, whether I want to answer their questions or not. You know, and, and the thing is, I don't want, I, I always, if you look at my Instagram page especially, I have so many posts about toxic people. I think if someone is truly toxic, you need to get rid of them in your life because I don't think you can heal and do well long term. Oh, hell no. I, the, my, my perspective on this is like, is I see an injured person, I see someone that's been hurt, and that's why they're hurting other people and why they're triggered and fucking with people online and all that. I know that because I was a person who was hurt a lot as a kid, and I right. used to hurt a lot of other people as a reaction to that. But I take no shit. You would like blocking people? I always say block and bless, man. Someone yeah, exactly. does block one little, and bless, baby. One right. little fucking negative comment, you're blocked. I don't want to talk about it. I'm not answering. I'm not going to argue and engage and drop down to that level. I'm just like, oh, you're done. You're done. You're done. <laughs> That's the way. Oh, yeah. You're, just, the you're out of my this life is the way. forever. That's the answer. The social but I, media but way. See, I, so, can I ask but all I don't you guys do a it, question? But I don't do it with if resentment you, or hostility. I mean, I'm not joking. Right. Social it's just media, efficiency. you block them in life? Oh, fuck yeah. Oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't, so I don't my, hate My love is, 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 is yeah, it's like I love them, but I don't like them. It's love from afar. You see what, what I'm about saying? You, Matt? If you block somebody, do you block them in I'm real life? I'm getting new to this thing, but uh, I haven't really had an experience where I've blocked. Yes, I've I've done that. I mean, there are people who have mostly low dopamine people from high school who have like I posted something and low then they're just like, oh my like god, this. oh my god, this is so offensive. And then I'm just like, all right, I don't really I'm need to talk I'm, to this person I'm ever again. This. Like, I'm interested in this topic because yeah, it's great. I, I told Luke that I think social media block is the best thing ever. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm not yeah. kidding. Yeah, no, I've I've blocked people and I they'll, you know, comment or message me like that's so offensive because they're part of that liberal communist ideology where they need to control what you think and they're not comfortable enough with maybe their own ideology where I, I don't know if this is right or not, but they actually want to control other people's thinking and they want to Oh, there's control. a lot of that. Yeah, you know what I'm getting yeah. at basically, but so I when think that social, comes around I, I just block media and I'm just, I don't need to talk about it. Huge problem for all of us because there's people that sit behind a uh, keyboard now and they th they think this gives them some kind of power and I i'm just <laughs> because amazed. they lack power in other aspects of yeah. their life that's the only reason they would feed any energy yeah, into that no because they have enough bandwidth it. yeah and i mean it's just which means it's even more reason to be like okay well why am I bless. dealing with you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just move right you know, along and you're not going move right along <laughs> maybe it's true <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. So I that was interesting, but so back to BDNF and movement and how it affects the biophysics stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Aaron, you mentioned that when people sit, you have seen some evidence and studies that show that their tissue, connective tissue, begins to m look more like scar tissue and so on, and mm -hmm. hardens. And that stuck with me because yeah, I sit a that. lot, but. I think based on Jack's thesis that maybe the fact that I'm in sunlight all the time or literally all the time, and if I'm not, I'm in the shade but still outdoors, barefoot, grounded, usually in a good spot, not on top of electricity, getting in the ocean and so on, that maybe my tissues wouldn't be hardening for, because I have the DC current flowing through, keeping all my connective tissue, collagen, and so on functional. Um, but if I were in blue light all day, that that would be the oh, effect. That's so what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you the biophysics. Jack? I'm going to tell you the biophysics part of this. I don't agree with Aaron's perspective <laughs> for this reason. <laughs> it's not my perspective. But it's just, just shit that I read. Right. This is this is what I don't I have any perspectives. On I this. believe that the interaction between light and water actually determines this. From my answer, the reason why is because water is an is an electromagnetic capacitor. So if you are in the sun, you're always going to be a better mover than if you're not now i think if you're in blue light i think then i think aaron's correct but i don't think it's a, a, a an all equals one you know i think there's a lot of variation here and i do believe that people that are in good light are always going to be better movers that's part of the reason why you know jeremy my good friend he climbs everywhere in the world in bright sun connected all four limbs to the rocks to me, that's the key. That's the reason why I told you earlier today that I'm a big fan of MoveNet. 
you know, I'm not a big fan of a lot of people in the functional uh, patterns thing because most of them are doing it indoors. Mm. To me, it doesn't make a lot of sense. That's part of the reason why I don't like any kind of stuff done inside when you move. I don't think it's a great idea. I mean, in fact, I'm going to tell you something. I almost said it today, and I, I just kept my mouth shut. People talk about meditation. It wasn't you that said it, but it was, you know, we're in the meeting. And I think if you do meditation inside in blue light, you're a fucking idiot. It's the stupidest thing I ever heard. I heard a guy today at the meeting downstairs say, well, every morning I get up and I meditate in my house, and I found that it's good for me. I'm like, that's not meditation, dude. That's, that's like a mental illness. It doesn't make any sense to me for you to do something like that in under artificial light and think that you're getting a huge benefit. Perhaps Definitely. he's doing it without artificial light, though. I meditate. That's impossible, my friend, if you're inside. Oh, because of glass windows? Exactly right. Oh, that's See, we need to teach you about the, yeah, we the, show spectroscope. You the spectroscope. When I show you the spectroscope, anybody who's inside, Aaron, even if it's sunny outside, is blue light toxic if you're inside? Hmm. Because the window blocks the purple and it takes out about 40 to 60 percent of the red so it doesn't have any effect on the blue so technically the blue on a relative basis is way more than the red so right. you're blue light toxic just by being inside hmm. so guess what that's we, nuts right it is nuts because you don't yes. think about this i never i'm like oh i don't have any lights on in here i'm getting natural light this is great right you don't think about this but that's part of the reason like we have the light on right now why this is kind of cool because you know there's bad stuff out here but and we don't really have any blue light on in here right now but the point is we don't think about this and we need to we need to think if we're, if we're gonna tell people we want you to go into a gym make sure that the gym's got good lighting or the opportunity for you to have outdoor light because I think that's what movement really, where it starts and where it begins for us. And that's one thing that's outside. cool at the at the Onnit gym. They have that big, uh, gr you know, that like a garage door yeah. that opens, you know, so you get all this natural light and air in there. I thought that was cool. A lot of the gyms kind of have that, I guess, now. They're kind of, they like take over an auto body shop and they have that big roll up door. Yeah. Yeah, that's Deuce Gym does it here. The oh, really? Right the place. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I that, I would be much more likely to work out <laughs> in a gym like that than right. I, I do. If I go to one of those, Equinox, one of these fancy yeah. gems with that fucking LED lighting, yes. it scrambles my brain. I can't right. even think. I don't. I don't know. And the music, I, yeah, the fucking rap Gold's and techno and well. stuff. I'm like, dude, I I gotta get out of here. I can't take it. Yeah, Gold's is the I I spend ninety eight percent of the time. There's like an outdoor area there, and Gold's in Venice as well. It's a better way to do. Yeah, it. it's so crazy. On the note of working out and building up your muscles, I don't do that at all. Mm -hmm. I haven't lifted a weight in. I since I was going to the YMCA with my friends in like eighth grade a long time ago, I will only maybe surf. Matt, that was only two years ago. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I was about five six, yeah. but um, so basically, just from after after learning about the stuff you've taught and applying it, I've been sort of just following my intuition and have not had any sort of pull to go and try to jack up my muscles. And I've learned from you that. At least in your case, you're focused on your brain and your heart mitochondria mm -hmm. and not on optimizing, let's say, the facade, mm -hmm. trying to lose the last bit of weight you could lose, uh, you know, beefing up your muscles because you'd be stealing basically, let's say, DC electricity or energy from the brain and the heart because mm -hmm. you're displacing mitochondria to make the muscles bigger. So I'm curious, in my case, I mean, I don't, like, functionally, it might help with let's say just looking a little beefier, stronger, or whatever, let's say for girls, women, whatever, that kind of thing. But, again, I don't even think that's really that big I, of a deal. I think, I think the story is, is more – I think it's – this is a very good topic because I think it's very counterintuitive for most people. There's several – I think most people have this belief that if you look like Michelangelo's Adonis at 70, 80, and 90 years old, that you're somehow healthier. So I make – the claim to people who actually say that to me in questions and answers or in talks that I give, say, okay, can you tell me any time in human history where we actually looked like that at 70, 80, and 90 years old? And it turns out those people are extremely rare. And I told um, Luke today when we were in the hot tub, Neil Barzai has a group of super centenarians. These are people that are 110 years older. 
they're old, fat Jewish guys with BMIs of 30. So the reason why this is a great question is because our paradigm of belief is, well, we should look like this. As we age, that means we're healthy, yet we have no representation. It's kind of like models in vogue that look like heroin addicts. Why do we want women to look like this? Yeah. Because it because That's it's, interesting because me, it's in a magazine. Well, I think the same thing is going on with muscles. And I don't want to make this a discussion about facades. I actually want to bring it to the biophysics. Do you know why humans get sarcopenia normally as they get older? What is sarcopenia? Sarcopenia is when you lose muscle mass and you get more fat. You is do it because your mitochondrial colony is failing. As you age, it goes up every 10%. Turns out, rate, right? Yeah. Yes. Current, turns out that carrying muscle mass is an expense. I'm stoked then. No, but I mean, it's yeah. an expense. And the thing is, we see people who are ripped up all the time die. Why is that if they're healthy? I mean, like just NFL happen. NFL players you're talking about. The NFL the- players, their, their life life is shortened, but we have... Fitness guys that look like Adonis that drop dead of heart attacks. You what about those? have a lot of like fat, slob, disgusting people that do as well. Well, that's it's, tr- it's the middle ground that's really like you can say that with like telomere length, like the people that are, that yeah. are excessive. I, I think telomeres are are really a bad. Well, you'll probably like what, maybe it's just a metaphor. I think most of these things are just like you know whatever. But uh, people that are excessively exercising, like maybe like CrossFit community or whatever. I think CrossFit with anything you can be balanced with any dogma. Um, but from the telomere perspective, which I'd be curious your thoughts on it, they'll see that is quite deleterious to the health of the telomeres, and then the same thing with being completely sedentary. So within that, it's like the middle path well, is me, the one that's the Let me give you the flip side to that argument, because you know, now I'm trying to be provocative with you. Please. Because we think that short telomeres are a problem, and people have on Earth. What did we find out about the astronauts that went up to ISS? Scott Kelly came back with longer telomeres, and it made no sense. Because he had a hypermethylated genome and he was actually sicker. So, what does that tell you? If you really think about what you said, mm. you may be right about people that are on the surface that shorter telomeres lead to bad outcomes and bad longevity. But what it tells me, Scott Kelly faced up there, is that he had the full electromagnetic spectrum up there and he came back with wildly different results. Mm. That tells me that when we change the electromagnetic environment on the surface, that we truly don't know the answer. The thing that I'm going to tell you is that carrying around skeletal muscle that's bulky as you get older when your colony is failing is a huge expense. I'm not saying you can't do it. I think it's possible to do, but I'm saying the days of us being able to do that are rapidly going away because we're now elevating the blue light and the 5g i think western a prices guys that i always like to talk yeah, about that's my what fav- i was going to ask about those guys were old as hell looking those, and they were those indigenous hunter gatherer yeah, guys. that picture from 1927 there right. was no freaking blue light and those guys were living outside right that's, how long were those guys living with their straight teeth and uh, muscular bodies well that, that picture that he showed one was 55 the other guy was 75 and the other guy was like 82 oh and they were all in a family together, and they all looked phenomenally and ripped. I think back then, I think in our human history, I think Matt's point, it was very possible and likely to happen, but I don't think any of us live that way anymore. And now we have... Daniel Vitalis, maybe. Well, we, but we... I think... I mean, the, I'm talking about living as like a hunter-gatherer right. in the wild, you know, that kind but, of thing. But look at even the Hasda we, or the Maasai. They're, they still live pretty wild. They're probably the most wild people outside of maybe some of the people in the Amazon. Mm-hmm. But when we go see those people today, they still don't look like that picture oh. that people have. Maybe those guy, those three guys were like the hut builders of the tribe or something. Why They're lifting heavy is, shit all day. I, you know those guys, the, the three reason, Af- the, the African or you know dark skin guys. Where I don't know where they no, were. They from. were they no, they were actually uh, aboriginals oh, okay. from the middle of the bush in Australia. And the, yeah. Oh, okay. And, and this picture was amazing. It's one of the most amazing pictures. In yeah, that I know, book. Cool. I know what you guys are talking about. Yeah, even though I've never read that book or don't know much that, about Western well, every, everybody needs to read that book. But the point What's that the I'm trying called? to make is why I think that that is never going to happen again is for the same reason I don't believe in calorie restriction 
is ever going to work because I think the electromagnetic environment has changed so tremendously that it's now physically impossible for that to occur. Mm -hmm. Now, do I believe that was the case in a previous part of Earth's history? No, I don't. Does that mean if we decide at some point to turn off how we're using technology that we couldn't go back to that? No, I don't. Uh, I mentioned to you guys, uh, especially Elliot, we talked about Jean Calmet today. She lived to 122.4 years old. You know, she didn't look like, you know, the female version of Adonis either, but she lived longer than anybody else. In fact, she did some things that most people would scratch their head and go, you got to be kidding me. She drank red wine every day. She ate dark chocolate. She lived in the south of France. Did she smoke cigarettes and as she well? She smoked cigarettes, and she quit when she was 100 years old. Do you know why she quit? God damn it. Mm. I want that life. She went blind. She couldn't light her cigarette anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but yet, she lived 22.4 more Spain years. Spain has, like, the longest uh, longevity. That sounds redundant. And they're, like, cigarette smoking, top of eating, alcohol drinking, community-focused people. Mm-hmm. What's with this Blue Zones shit? The Blue Zone stuff has actually been blown out the water. Dan Butner. It's fake ass? No, it's not fake ass. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's now reversed. Like people, you know, we always talk about the Okinawans. <laughs> yeah. They had great longevity. Yeah. In, in one the genera- Inuits, uh, you know. Right. Well, in one generation, now it's flipped. Their longevity is no oh. longer so great. Guess why? So blue zones were real, but now well they're, they're changing fake it. Ass. And the point is, it goes <laughs> it, it goes to what Matt and you guys are bringing up is that look, we don't realize as modern humans how much we're changing things. And the thing is, I think the ultimate outcome of what can happen is going to change. Yeah. Yeah. See, with all with the stuff you're talking about, where we're you know we're devolving now, right? We can't see it because we're in the middle of it. Right. Like we're in the middle of it's this true. soup, and because if you're an outlier like you are, and you're like, dude, hello, wake up, and you have these predictions four or five years ago about blue light and the effects, and now it's coming to fruition. Now it's at the mainstream, and people on the periphery are at least going, oh wow, okay, we'll look into this. And in five years from now, we can only hope people go, oops, 5G, bad idea. But still, we're all in the middle of it, and we're kind of used to feeling the way we feel and looking the way we look and getting the illnesses we get. And it's like, this has just become the new normal. It's like, imagine if you went back and, you know, teleported from 1850 to right now and looked around and was like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. You have what disease? What is that? Right. You know, it's crazy, but it's difficult for us to see because we're just too close to it. It's like standing in front of the Mona Lisa and... With your eyes six inches from the goddamn canvas, it's like you can't see the full picture. And that, that I think, is very, very important. It's an important statement. It's, it's one of the key things that when I talk, I don't think people realize that's actually what I'm saying. That's what makes technology really difficult for people to understand because we are so indebted to it. We're so in bed with it. That it's now blinded us. <laughs> We're to, literally in bed with it. But it's blinded us to the reality that it's changing our reality. Right. And and that's that's really the point that I'm trying to make to you. I think what is gonna be considered healthy going forward is radically gonna change. Like our definitions for it are going to change. And this this is not acceptable to some people. They have a problem with this, you know. Um, I don't. I, I, to me, because it makes sense, as the environment changes, the art trajectory changes. You know, that's what evolution is really all about. And it doesn't mean that some in our, some in our clade couldn't go a different way than others. I actually believe that's actually happening. I need to go to sleep. <laughs> I got a question before yeah. we do that. Yeah, yeah. Why does breath work make you feel so awesome? If I do kundalini yoga, if I do Wim Hof, if I use my breath and my body... I feel so amazing. Why? I think it's because it affects your mitochondrial function. I mean, it's changing the redox power. Remember, what uh, oxygen does, it's at the end of your wire. So if you have more oxygen there, you pull more current across it. If you pull more current across it, as long as your cytochromes aren't trashed, you're going to feel better. If your cytochromes are trashed, you'll feel worse. That's part of the reason why I tell people I'm not a fan for everybody to have um, uh, hyperbarics. Because if you have trash cytochromes, hyperbaric oxygen is not good for you. And how do you find out if you have trash cytochromes? Well, you're usually going to have some kind of mitochondrial disease. 
Oh, okay. You so, know, so, so for example, if you have diabetes, okay. it, it's usually... So since I don't have any clinically diagnosable disease right now, my cytochromes are... No, I think yours are probably decent. okay, but the thing that I want you to pay attention to, mm -hmm. since you're in a 5G city now, you may be fine now at 48, but two years from now, you may not realize that something else is going on. Right. You know, and then when you try it and you use it, you get worse. But look, I have an example of this in medicine. When people get ARDS, that's a, a really serious lung disease, they go from being well to in the ICU, literally deathly ill, and they can't breathe because their lungs are filling up with crap. What do we do? We increase their FiO2, which means that we're giving them more oxygen. As we give them more oxygen, you think they would get better? They actually get worse. And we can kill them through organ system failure. Why does that happen? Because as you raise oxygen, they make more ROS. More ROS leads to the organ failure. So this is the crazy thing about oxygen. We all think that oxygen is necessary. It turns out there are situations where oxygen can kill you. Wow. And people don't realize this. This is the reason why some of the alternative health guys out there can be extremely dangerous when they recommend, well, everybody should get HBO. Well, you know, one of the key things that you see out there, many people talk about HBO and kids with autism. Kids with autism have... What's HBO? HBO, hyperbaric, hyperbaric oh, oxygen. Oh, oh, okay, okay. So, you know, if you go in a dive tank, the okay. thing is... Many people with autism get told, oh, you should have HBO. These kids get HBO, and they get worse, and they start getting other problems. I thought you were talking about subscribing to Showtime. Yeah, me too. I was like, yeah, it's, <laughs> the, it's the blue light, the TV. <laughs> you got to shut it off. What about, uh, what about uh, ozone? What about ozone IVs? <laughs> oh. I mean, isn't there, I'm gonna, I'm isn't gonna there proof I'm, of improving mitochondrial yes, function? There, there is. Because the I've been doing this shit for but, like but a the, few the weeks proof, now. The proof is, I'm going to tell you, doesn't meet my clinical I'm not a, I'm not a, a buyer do I believe it can help some people the answer is yes do I think it's one of those therapies that the person that's prescribing it needs to know exactly what they're doing and the person that's getting it better have their eyes wide open that's how I look at it I think most of the people using it Luke from the medical perspective I don't think they're educated enough to really know what they're doing. If you're not a true mitochondriac, utilizing ozone can be a very dangerous procedure. Have you looked into uh, Frank Schallenberger's stuff? Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Are you on? Are you think he's on point? I mean, that's kind of where I, I'm going to for yeah, information on I, this. I, I think a lot of the things that he has is good. You know what my problem with him is? I don't think he understands mitochondria very well. Mm. And that's my problem. My problem is... I think most of the work that he's done is on people that have decent redoxes, but what happens when you don't? And you don't tell people this issue, and then they start using ozone and they get worse. What do you do then? I don't know how valuable this will be to the listeners, but I think it will be once they get the whole picture, and this will be a, a gold gem for them to go back to. So you said that ATP is not the main energy currency in cells. What it does is it unfolds proteins so they can be exposed to water, and then the ultimate energy currency, and this is proven by Gilbert Ling and the work of Pollock, is that sunlight shines on that water, creates a battery, and that provides energy. But how does that work? Like, w how does the energy power the proteins, and how does it flow through the water? And then how does that make us actually alive? And this is why sun's more important than food and why if you don't get sun, food isn't going to make up for it. But how does it actually work, the energy flowing well, through the water and powering the proteins and everything? Solar light hits water. Water is an electromagnetic capacitor because what does it do? It has a high heat uh, capacity. That means that it can absorb shit tons of, of light. Once the light is in the water network, I want you to think about it as a battery in a car. It becomes able to use many different things. So the protein that has these side chains, they get photonically activated. In other words, you're changing the spin state of electrons and protons. You're actually changing the spin state of photons that are buried in the water to do things that it can do. So the protein, remember, it has four different protein folding abilities. It's called primary, secondary, quaternary, and, and I should say tertiary and quaternary. The first two bends of proteins are controlled by DNA, the DNA code. 
guess what the last two bends are controlled by? The redox power in the cell. So what's the redox power in the cell? The net negative charge, which is tied to the amount of light that's buried in the water. So the last two bends are the keys to the thermodynamics that are possible in a protein. So the light can change the shape shifting. That's actually how life becomes vital, how an abiotic atom becomes activated. Why? It's the level of energy in the system that controls it at the protein level. There we go. It's pretty interesting. I can't wait to re-listen to this. That's a mic drop right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you know the cool thing is? He just asked me like a really fundamental question, like what is life? That's really what he asked me. Yeah. And, and, and that question has been asked to many, many people. My answer that I just gave him probably has 15 critical scientists that actually help me understand how the process really works. The, this did not, Jack Cruz did not come up with this. This was all other people who have studied this made me realize what the process really is about. And when you understand how the biophysical levers control this in a cell, that's when you really start to understand how we work. And that's the reason why you see Parkinson's and Alzheimer's with those last two bends and you get protein folding, you know, diseases. Hunting's disease is a disease like that too. That's a, a different one controlled by DNA, but it's effectively in there. ALS, I think, is an electromagnetic disease that's caused by the same process. Mm -hmm. This mechanism is built into many different diseases, but we don't seem to realize it. Um, so to me, I think it's kind of a good question to end on because... It's one of those questions where you say, well, how do we learn about this? You have to read Roland Van Wick's book. You have to read Pollock's book. You have to Is read Gilbert Ling. One of the Gilbert Ling ones? was the guy that came up with the original idea, but his idea wasn't completely correct. In other words, there's other people that gave their other two cents. If you ask me, the guy that was the, the rocket scientist in all this was Albert St. Georgie. Uh -huh. if, if anybody has never read Albert St. George's work, especially you as a movement guy, you absolutely need to get in because this guy was fucking brilliant. I mean, he truly was brilliant. He's the guy that came out and, and said in 1941 in his Nobel lecture, he said, I think life works by semiconduction. And the dude was spot on. We didn't prove it until Becker, until almost 25 years later. Um. To me, he's one of the rock stars of the 20th century. That he's the nope. Keith Richards of uh, yeah. understanding <laughs> physiology. Well, but, and, we, and we never really talk about him, you know? Well, then he's not the Keith Richards. He's the, he's the Ron Wood. He's the yeah. unsung hero. There you go. <laughs> he's the bass player. All right. Let's put it that way. All right. All well, right. Luke's story's got to go to bed. Luke's right. story. I guess we're all going to bed. Where do we, how do we end this? So we should probably maybe just point everywhere and we, I don't know how we're going to release this. <laughs> I'll point across. Aaron I, has the we? Align podcast. Yeah, I haven't listened go. to it too much, but the few episodes I have listened to are pretty good. Mm. And he's a cool dude. He's pretty tall, kind of handsome. And uh, he, uh, you know, does this movement thing and apparently it works. Apparently. For if we were people. downstairs, he goes, hey, want to go out in the hall and do some acro yoga? I was like, yeah, whatever the <laughs> fuck that is. Sure. I like yoga. That's we go out there. Homeboy's got me suspended up in the air, like <laughs> flooring me around like a rag doll. I'm 6'2", 185 pounds, dude, just like flinging me around. Did you stretching say you're 285 pounds? No, what? 185. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you just, yeah. You're graded yourself an extra yeah, he's 100 pounds. Yeah, he's a movement master. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He knows, he knows the body. I appreciate that. Yeah. Keep and on going. Keep Luke on. Luke has a podcast called The Lifestyle. Stylist podcast it is very good. Uh, Dr. Cruz has been on there before. Aaron, I don't know if you've been he on has. there yet. You yeah. have. Yeah. I have myself as well. Yeah. And I uh, don't have a podcast. <laughs> That's yeah. pretty good. Jack doesn't have a podcast. He just cuts people's heads open. And my podcast isn't quite mine, but it's to be announced. Just uh, stay to, tuned. MattRuby.com. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> yeah, we're gonna be talking about it <laughs> this week. With, Poor Maddie. He's yeah. got. He's got like. <laughs> Six amazing episodes in the can, and he's like, I can't put them out, and I can't talk about it. All right, yeah. over and out. Thank right, you so much guys. for following along. We'll yep. see how this one drips out.
Thank you so much for tuning in that conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, we got a couple things to help support that body of yours, one of which is the Align Band that people have been really loving, which I'm super grateful for. Um, it is a heavy-duty resistance band, comes along with a door anchor, traveling case, and then a online video guide on how to use that thing. It's my absolute go-to travel tool. I've got it hanging literally from my door right beside me now. Um, use it regularly. Use it with clients. Uh, it can be found at alignpodcast.com slash gear uh, on Amazon. And you can also find it at Align Band on Instagram. Um, also, we finally did it. We created the Align Method online program, which focuses on unwinding the patterns of staring into technology, essentially. So forward head posture, rolled forward shoulders, rolled forward spine, kind of like just that hunchy posture thing that um, modern world is is stricken by uh, gets into how to align your physical body. So self-care, joint by joint, from ankle to knee to hip to spine to head to neck, etc. Really good stuff. Also gets into lifestyle, um, gets into morning routines, nighttime routines, how to effectively handstand, how to move on the ground. Um, people have been loving that. Thank you all for grabbing it, the ones that have. And if people have any questions about that, you can reach out at Align Podcast on Instagram. I'm happy to support. All right. Thank you, guys. Enjoy your day. Thanks for doing you. Thanks for telling your friends. Thanks for reviews on iTunes. That's it.